What's up, gang? Getting, uh, you're getting soft in your old age, huh? I don't yeah. know about that. I, I think I, I, that is true, yes, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I, I saw something. I, I, and, and then now we're starting to find out this guy's never had an MMA coach and stuff like that. And I just talked to Bisbing because I heard Bisbing said some stuff about him too. And uh, I don't know. There's something there, man. This, this guy's tough. Dur when you get these guys that, that work, um, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, then go play around with MMA and try to fight. And this is, this is where real dudes come from, these, these type of places. And I don't know. I saw something tonight. We'll see how it goes. So you get him down to the right weight class. You get him training with a real team. You get him, you know. Th th and, and the other thing that you got to look at is who he fought. He fought a guy who was minus 1,000, right? And uh, look, look who he trains with. Every day. This guy's been killing people. He's 7-0. and 0. Um, He's in the hospital. This kid isn't. What's that tell you? That ain't getting soft in my old age. That's, there's something there. When did, you make the, when did you make the decision, right? Because the guy was entertaining. He was taking a lot of damage. But, you know, it's like, oh, is he showboating while he's losing? No, it was an all-night process because, first of all, I, I was blown away that this thing went to decision. Then I, then I, I told uh, Hunter – Send that guy straight to the hospital. Don't, you know, he might be one of those too tough for his own good kind of guys. And, you know, let's get him right to the hospital. Then uh, I go in the back and no, Magomed's at the hospital. Um, and this kid's fine. They, they checked him four times. He's absolutely fine. He's good. He's in good spirits. And he just wants to uh, go back to the hotel. So, you know, all night as this all just started to kept registering with me. And then I went out and Literally didn't tell anybody except Laura Sanko that we had, that I was going to keep him. That's amazing. You mentioned the, the weight class change. There were a couple guys tonight that you said probably weren't in the right weight class. Do you say that to them? Do you say, like, hey. I, I don't it's not tonight. It's, it's most nights. I mean, when you look at guys who fight in other shows, you know, um, you, you know the, the last fight. I mean, th this kid looks like an 85-pounder. He's never fought at 85, ever. Um, and then Rodolfo looks like a heavyweight. You know, um, yeah. But again, he was a two-to-one dog, Rodolfo, against a guy who looked like he's 85 pounds. Yeah. The, the guy who looks like a heavyweight was the underdog, two-to-one. So. Any any standouts? I mean, we didn't. I mean, we didn't necessarily get like the viral highlight reel moment, but you did have three stoppages. Was there any that stood out the most to you out of anybody that you're like that? That's the one I liked the most tonight. Yeah, it would probably be uh, who stood out the most tonight to me. It would have to be, I guess, uh, I mean, Rufi would have to be the guy that, that, that stood out the most tonight. Although, Rodolfo looked damn good. Damn good. I mean, the guy never stopped just trying to finish the fight. Punches, knees, elbows, kicks. He threw the kitchen sink at that guy. Yeah. One other thing I did want to ask you about tonight, uh, obviously we only had four fights, had a fighter miss weight significantly. And you guys decided to reschedule it. Were there, like, some extenuating circumstances? I think normally if somebody misses weight by five pounds, I'd imagine you'd be like, hey, thanks anyway. That was your shot. Do you know why I was decided to move that fight? To yeah. The yeah, so, so Mick hit me and said that, that, that he had missed the weight. Mick still wanted to do the fight. So I said do the fight. That doesn't throw you off? Like, I mean, obviously that's rule number one in fighting, right, is you got to make yeah. weight. You're off to a bad start, kid. But, yeah, we'll see what happens. But well, I'll definitely take that in consideration during the fight, too. But, you know, these guys train. They got ready and whatever. And Mick wants to do the fight, so I'm doing it. Nice. Just a couple outside of tonight. Uh, we saw today Alexa Grasso went through surgery as well for her hand. Just curious if you could tell us about her condition and if that changes anything in terms of the, the plans and the schedule to do the rematch with her. Uh, they, they both have hand injuries, so it's uh, – we'll, we'll, it's a – it's a, let's see what happens. I mean, the, the, traditionally, those types of surgeries, you know, six to eight weeks, they start figuring out where they're at, and we got time. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the stories in the MMA world continue speculation about Bellator, and you've been asked a couple times. I'm just curious, are you monitoring the situation with them at all, and do you care? Because I know in the past you said, like, hey, we need these organizations out there, and there seems to be a fear that maybe it could just completely go away. Are, are you monitoring that at all, and do you have any concern over what happens? Literally not at all. I mean, uh, obviously – if Bellator, if Bellator continues to exist, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Um, you know, if you look at all the shit that we take about a lot of things, they're owned by fucking Viacom. You know how much money these guys have? Why would they be going out of business unless they're just 
tired of doing it because you're hearing rumors about Showtime too, not just Bellator. So, you know, um, you know what I think of, of, of Showtime as a company. It's, there's no secret, you know. Um, again, I could go on for days about their production on Saturday. They tried to do it better. I noticed Showtime, I noticed you tried to do it better, but you guys suck. <laughs> Last question I would ask. There was a story that came out today in, in the SBJ that you would be interested in doing a show at the Sphere, obviously the hot new property. Is that just more like a, hey, we'll check it out, or is that like we got to do a show inside this you know, amazing new venue? No, it's not a check it out. I mean, I, I'm sure you guys that are here in Vegas, I mean, it was, everybody was buzzing about the U2 concert on Saturday. They said it was incredible. Um, the guys from MSG, whom I have a great relationship with the guys who own it, um, MSG does everything right. Everybody that went, usually... Let me tell you what happens, and you, you've pro probably been a part of this. When a restaurant opens for the first night, when a hotel opens for the first night, it's a shit show. And, you know, there's lots of bad things. They're trying to figure it out. I haven't heard one negative thing about the opening of the Sphere. The exact opposite. Everybody talked about how incredible it was. And I'll tell you this, when you go to arenas in this city, right, and let's say you own a box or you go in a box, the food is horrendous. The food is unexplainably fucking disgusting. Let's just start there. What I heard, I didn't go, but what I heard is the food was outrageously over the top good. Everybody's experience getting in and out was good. From what I hear, the guys at MSG couldn't have hit a bigger home run with the opening of the sphere. So it's not a meh, let's see how this goes. I mean, these guys are, 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 are one of the biggest and best and all of the arena business, and they fly into Las Vegas, first of all, the balls to open that place and to do what they're doing, and then to come in and hit an absolute grand slam home run with the opening. And you all know that I want that date. I, that's what I want. I want. I want to do Mexican Independence Day there. Imagine the show that I can put on at the Sphere with Mexican Independence Day. So, yeah, we'll, we'll fucking put on an incredible show in that amazing arena for, 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 for the next Mexican Independence Day. So I'm very excited about it. Nice. Dan, to go back to tonight, um, with Medina, you know, the Contender Series has been a great vehicle for guys coming into the UFC, and sometimes it's because there's like a quirky story around them, like Raul Rosas Jr., the youngest guy ever. You know, Sean O'Malley's commentated by Snoop Dogg. Do you think the fact that he lost tonight but looked so tough and you've made this decision on the fly will bring more attention to him when he does make his debut? No, that's a good question. That's definitely interesting. You know, there's obviously a story around the guy, and uh, the big question about him now is, am I right or am I wrong about this guy? Uh, the first fight, Rufy, he had some great success with the calf kicks early, and then during the third round, he sort of halfway through went away from them to get the finish with the hands. Do you, when you watch a fighter having success with those calf kicks and they stop throwing them, do you have an internal, like, come on, throw that kick again, or do you just sort of think, oh, well, what are they going to do? Hell yes. I mean, that's one of the things. Remember when, when, when he walked back and talked to Laura Sanko and she said, you two had a long conversation. Well, he doesn't speak English, so he doesn't know what the hell I was saying anyway. But I was saying to his coaches, um, he was picking him apart in that third round, right? He was using the leg kick in the beginning to set up all these great combinations. And then he completely abandoned the leg kick halfway through that round. And I was saying, when he goes back and looks at the tape, he finished them anyway. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm enlightening these guys or anything. But he ended up getting the finish anyway. But um, he, uh, he looked damn good. And, and, and it would have been interesting if he kept throwing the leg kick and setting up the combinations, what he could have done. But, yeah, I mean, kid looked great tonight. Thank you. Hi, Dana. Hi. Uh, you mentioned, you know, you've already talked a little bit about Bellator and Showtime, but I want to know about one championship and Chaudhry's comments about the UFC fighters. Sounds yeah, so I get it. I, I, I got no, no, no beef with those guys. And, you know, because I called out that production thing for Showtime, of course, he comes out and, you know, says that today um, or whenever he said it. But, yeah, I, I, I got no beef with those guys. That, that was an Espinosa thing, but you have to admit, you know, uh, the walkout thing was hilarious, and uh, the guy comes out with the coffee, and you know, it was like a it was like a Saturday Night Live skit. But um, yeah, I, I wasn't trying to take a shot at those guys. It, it, it is what it is, and I mean, in all honesty, what should my response be to what he said? I mean, 
I'll let that speak for itself. Uh, UFC 295 is going to fall on Veterans Day this year. I'm just curious. There's a couple fighters on there that are veterans themselves and have asked to potentially have some shorts that honor them. Is that is that a possibility or have sure. something? Sure. All right. Absolutely. That was easy. Um, and also a fan mentioned uh, a fight card that I thought was kind of interesting. I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Um, they suggested that Volkanovski and Ilya Toporia fight. And then it's Komain, O'Malley, and Marab, and potentially have you know two Georgian fighter, two, uh, two Georgian champions on one night. What are your thoughts on that kind of a card? When, when are they saying this? Uh, they're just saying, Whenever. "Oh, this would be Whenever. great." Whenever, yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> we, 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 we we have. I think we have fights made all the way up to like February third uh, or tenth or something like that. So we, we've already, and we've got ideas for for March and April. So. So are any of those four fighters I mentioned? What was, the first, what was the main event that you said? The main event would be um, Volkanovski and Ilya Toporia. Okay. No. Co-main event. No. We don't have any of those, no. Well, you said you but who, who, a who, ago. Who, who, who suggested this? Just a fan. Oh. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Well, thank you for your input, but uh, no, we don't have any of those yet. Thank you. Thank you. Dane over here. Yep. Is Jose Medina getting the contract, the craziest story in Contender Series, given he's never had a proper coach and obviously the toughness he showed out tonight? Is Jose what? What, what did he say? Is that the craziest story, given like his background going into this fight and all that? Yeah. Yeah, and the fact that I'm signing him, too. I mean, it's all – it's just – yeah, it's all crazy. I, I, I don't know. Well, we didn't find out he didn't have a, an MMA coach till after the fight. When I signed him, his guy came back and said, listen, this guy's never really had a coach. This guy just does this on the side. Um, so it made me even like my decision more. And I uh, saw you mentioned there that Showtime tried to do a better job with the production. I'm assuming you're referring to this past Saturday, if, I'm, if, that, if that's correct. Um, Yes. What did you think of the fight? Let me give you an example. This is how good our production is. Did you see Pettis there tonight? Okay, so the kid that threw the Pettis kicks off the fence, there was three seconds left to the round, right? Three seconds left to the round. I picked up my big red phone. I called the truck. I said, put those Pettis kicks in the, in the, in the, in the package. No problem. Hung up the phone. They put the three seconds left to the round. They put them in there, and they showed Pettis. Now, if any of you were home watching that fight that night on Showtime, <laughs> they were trying to do more replays. The replays were so bad. There was, there was a set of replays where in both replays, nobody landed a fucking punch. So then you got the, the commentators trying to oh, talk about what's going on, and it's, they were terrible replays. They just, when you know production, right, these guys are supposed, they're a fucking major network. They're supposed to be anyway. Showtime, Viacom, whatever. That's your fucking, that's the, the, the product that you're putting on. When you know what you're looking for and you know what you're talking about in the production world, there's nobody that can disagree with me that Showtime is a horrible, horrible fucking production team. And, and listen, maybe it's because they, they want to, they're not willing to stay in Bellator. They're not willing to maybe move forward with boxing. So what does that tell you? They're not putting any money into it. There's probably no money in it. And the guys can't do it. I don't know what the answer is, but it's embarrassing. God bless all of them that work on that show. And uh, I want to ask you about something non-fighting related for just a second. You actually own a PBR bull. Um, how did that come together? I'm deaf, so bear with me. And you're on my bad side. Oh, I, we, I did looking for a fight back in 15 or 16. Dumbest thing I've ever done, riding a bull. But after I did it, I kind of got into it. You know, the whole, we went out on this, on this ranch, this guy, Dennis Davis Bucking Bulls, his, his ranch. And I said, I, I, I want to get into this. I'll buy a bull. So I bought a bull. He didn't do very well. I bought another bull. He didn't do very well. You know, the bull business is a rough business. And uh, finally, after all these years, I now have a bull that's actually going to buck in PBR. And this bull is nasty. Nasty, nasty. So um, 
he made it to the big time, and uh, he's going to be here next week. He's coming to UFC. I'm going to have him out in the parking lot. <laughs> swear to God. He's, he's going to be in the parking lot next week. You guys, hey, you got to do like a media day. Have the media come. <laughs> this thing will scare the shit out of you, okay? They look at you like they want to kill you, okay? It is, it's fun. You'll become hooked. And if you guys are in town and you're not in Abu Dhabi, he's, he's going to be bucking uh, at the PBR here in Vegas at T-Mobile. So, so, so those of you that are here, if you want to go, let us know, and we'll get you guys set up over there to go check him out. Um, but, yeah, he's going to be here. Now, what day is he getting here? Huh? 16th of October he'll be here. He'll be, he'll be in, the, in the parking lot of UFC headquarters. We'll be looking forward to meeting him then. But um, I also remember when Howlerhead sponsored Trackhouse and NASCAR. Do you guys have any other plans to venture into other sports and industries? <laughs> PBR. <laughs> PBR. PBR. Yeah. He's, he, he's, they're, they're sponsoring the, the truck that pulls them and, and stuff like that. Yeah. We don't have that kind of money yet. So we, 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 we had fun with the NASCAR thing. And uh, I'm actually meeting with NASCAR again uh, this month. Are you going to sponsor like a specific team or like with working with NASCAR? With NASCAR? Yeah. I don't know yet. We're, we're, uh, I'm flying down to Arizona, me and Lorenzo actually. Me and Lorenzo are flying down to Arizona um, this month and, and meeting with all the powers that be of NASCAR and talking to them about some stuff. Because me and Lorenzo are working on a lot of stuff together again. So. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. Dana? Yep. Just wanted uh, your thoughts on this coming weekend's main event, Grant Dawson versus Bobby Green. Uh, Grant's finally getting his first main event, fighting a UFC veteran like Bobby Green. What do you, um, like, I guess just, what were your thoughts on Grant Dawson as a fighter? Like, I, I feel like he's one of the most underrated f uh, lightweight fighters in the, in the, in the division. Do you, do you kind of feel the same way? We're going to find out on Saturday. That's, that's the beauty of this. Uh, you know, uh, it's what I love about, about the sport and, and, and about the matchmaking that we do here. The question is, is he underrated? Bobby Green is the perfect fight to find out if that's true or not. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I love this main event, and I'm excited for it. And then uh, finally for me. The whole card is good, too. Pie for fight is, is, is a fun fight, too. And, um, yeah. Um, it's been about almost a month uh, since Sean Strickland beat Israel Asanya. Um, now that you've had a month to kind of think about it, is the plan for, for Sean to rematch Israel? Or are you kind of waiting to see what the result is of, of Paulo Costa versus Hamzat Shemaev? Like, are you kind of just seeing how that fight goes? Or do you kind of have a plan? Going yeah, forward? I mean, that, that fight just happened. And, uh, you know, a, a couple of fights are going to play out here now over the next month or so. And, uh, and, and then we'll go from there and figure out what's next. Whatever, whatever the best fight to make um, when all is said and done and, and who's injured, who's not injured, who can go, what time, where, you know, there's a lot of different factors that play into what we're going to do next. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. You guys done with me? Hey, Dana. Yeah. What's the conversation like at home when you're saying, I'm going to buy some balls? The conversation with who? At home, when you're saying, I'm going to get into PBR balls, I'm going to buy balls. Ah, it's not that I have the I, I just kind of come home and tell everybody at home. <laughs> I just bought some bulls. <laughs> We're in the bull business. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that's kind of how it works. I get, like, puppies. What do you, do, you, do you cuddle a bull? What do you do with it, aside from, like, bucket? Well, you show up on the uh, 16th and let me know if you can cuddle a bull. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, this thing's going to scare the shit out of you. This, 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 this bull is mean and nasty. And, uh, no, uh, you know, I got this guy, like I said, Dan his name is Dennis Davis. He owns Dennis Davis Bucking Bulls. So he takes care of the bulls. He, he, he gets them ready, takes them out, and does all the stuff. So I'm just like the... Uh, I fund them and then watch them. And, and, and you know, the, the goal is whether you get into into the, the PBR bull thing or you get into horse racing or whatever it is, the goal is to win. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long... I just saw this incredible story on... Um, I, I think it was on HBO, like Real Sports or one of those. And I don't ever really watch that stuff. Um, but I watched it the other day, and it was the, the basketball player. Did you guys see this? The NBA basketball player. I can't remember his name, but he was a big guy in, like, the, 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 the ni late 90s, 2000s or whatever. And he fell in love with NASCAR. Him and, him and his dad went to a NASCAR race, and he ran into one of the big NASCAR stars, and he became obsessed with it. And he's been putting all his money into NASCAR all these years, and he finally just won a race. 
And I thought it was the coolest story ever, man. It was a really, really good story. Um, so good, I can't remember anybody's names or any of that shit. But uh, it, it's a cool story. If you, if you look it up, I think it was on HBO Real Sports. But, um, you know, it's kind of like that. I, I got into it, and, and uh, I like it. And I don't know how long I'll stay into it, but, you know, we're going to the PBR. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what the result is uh, after, after he, uh, he performs. We'll see where we go from here. Just piggybacking off something John said about the sphere. I know you've recently told us that whenever there's something in production, you, um, you know, it, when it's finished, you, you always watch it before it goes to air. With the graphics on the sphere, would you want to kind of have some say in like having some UFC custom stuff to be broadcast on the interior or even the exterior? Absolutely, a hundred percent. Yes, I mean. Every time we do, uh, we, we put on a production, um, we, we control, we film, we, we, we do everything. A to Z, we, we, we cover it all. You ever look at a, at, a, at a production of ours, right? And you have a problem with it and you think it sucks, the buck stops right here. I am completely engaged in all the production. And, and, uh, but we're such a well-oiled machine right now. And the, the team that, that we've built over the last, you know, these guys know exactly what I'm looking for. It's very rare that I pick up that red phone and I'm pissed off about something. And if it's something that, I'm, that I do get mad about, you, the consumer, would never even notice it anyway. But, but, but I do. Um, and I'm just telling you guys this. Wait till you see October 25th. Wait till you see the production of the next slap event. I'm telling you right now. Wait till you see this. It, it, you know, from you guys already know the production. You know how fast when a when when a, when, a, when a slap ends, immediately the replay is up there from 30 different angles, right? And I told you before we have more cameras than the NFL on power slap. All right. Now as we go into the 25th, wait till you see the features and the vignettes and the things that that we just shot last week. Just, there's, there's no, bo HBO boxing didn't compare to what we're doing with Slap. It's just, we, when you talk about television production and sports, it, it just, it's not comparable. With the sphere and how good it looks, and you're saying about it, you know, maybe having Mexican Independence Day there next year, does that make a fight at the Allegiant Stadium less likely? The, you, you, you know that, you know, with Allegiant, you have to have the right fight at the right time. And, the, you know, to, to sell that many tickets, you know what I mean? It's just, you'd have to have the right fight. I mean, when you think about stadiums, right, and especially in this country, I, I, I don't love the experience in a stadium. Now, when you go over to Australia and the U.K., they're used to watching sporting events in stadiums. The United States, we're used to watching or in, them in arenas. And I just think that when you're talking about fighting, you get such a better experience in an arena than you do a stadium. Although, you know, we did Rousey versus um, I'm Home in Australia, and it was awesome in the stadium. It took me 46 minutes to walk back to my green room, but uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's, they're just used to experiences in stadiums more than we are here, especially fights. Thanks, Dana. Yep. Cool. What do you got? One follow-up. I was just going to uh, – you, you told Big Boy that you were going to watch Oscar De La Hoya's documentary. I, I didn't yet. I, I didn't yet. I'm going to – I didn't yet. I, to be honest with you, I don't watch a lot of TV. But um, what I did love was the Nelk Boys interview with Canelo. First of all, let's start with this. How classy is Canelo? I mean, one of the classiest guys in the world. When, when I watched this, it's really the first – interview that I've ever seen Canelo in, because obviously they're my, they're my guys, so, so I was watching the interview. Canelo is incredibly classy, but what have I told all of you for years about him, him being De La Hoya, and what did Canelo say? Yeah, and it isn't just me.